Okay, hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming down on a Saturday morning. Uh, hope everyone's midterms have been good so far. And so today we will actually be going to teach you about HTML and CSS. Uh, we will first begin with HTML, CSS, and after that we will have some practice with it. And then we will proceed on to actually have some hands-on practice. And then uh, we will move on to like putting it on the web and then you can make it live and public for everyone to see your work. So before we get started today, we will need a couple of tools for today's workshop. Uh, you will need your web browser. Uh, Mozilla Firefox will work, Chrome will also work. Uh, you will need a code editor. So preferably you can get VS Code installed. And then if you don't have a local Git client already installed, it's best if you uh, install it. We won't be using the Git directly, but then we will be using it through the help of VS Code itself. So don't worry if you are not familiar with the Git CLI. And then if you don't have a GitHub account, it'll be best if you, so that we can actually make use of some of the GitHub features to publish our website later. So uh, you can actually get to, because we have a repository set up to actually provide you with some of the sample codes. So you can just visit this link and then you will be able to uh, clone this repository into your own account. And then from there, you will be able to download it later. So I will wait for like perhaps one or two minutes so everyone can just visit this link in the meantime. We now will move on to setting up your local machine. So especially for those who are unfamiliar with how uh, VS Code works, you will need to, once you have installed it, just open it up and then you will need to open up the command palette. Uh, so let me see if I can, yeah, you can press, you can actually press view command palette and then the shortcut for Windows and Linux should be Control Shift T for Mac, I'm not very sure. So you probably can just press view and like, Command palette, and then you should be able to go git clone. And then once you the git clone, uh, it should be able to allow you to select GitHub, and then from there there will be an automatic uh login to GitHub. You click on it, a link will open, and then GitHub will prompt you to allow access to allow VS Code to have access to your account. And then once you have given the access, uh, you will be able to see the repositories available in your account, and then you can choose the repository that you have done. So, so. Oh, uh, in this case, you can, is there a, like, this angle bracket when you try to type? So, My understanding is it's built into VS Code, the Git extension should came by default. If you don't have it, you can actually fire up the extension tab and then you should be able to look for Git itself. But uh, for it to work, you must ensure that you already have the Git client installed because it, at the back end, it actually requires the local Git client in order to function properly. Yeah. So if you have any problem, do sound off. Uh, cannot see use this template. Mm -hmm. So if we were to go back to this particular link, uh, if you were to visit this particular repository, that should be the use this template button. Let me just double check that it's the correct repository. Yeah, there should be this use this template as long as you are signed in. Uh, just ensure that you have signed in and yeah, all right.
So once you have cloned the repository, the next step is to actually open up the extensions tab at the side and then look for the live preview extension. So this is like, uh, it will generate a live preview of the HTML that we'll be writing later so that you get like visual feedback. So it's a bit like Microsoft Word in a way. So whatever you type is whatever you get at the side. So just look for it. It should be, the publisher should be uh, Microsoft VS Code. So we don't install the wrong one. I have attached a screenshot here. So it should be quite clear which extension it is. Okay, so for the benefit of those on Zoom, I've actually pasted the link to today's slide. So I think it will be easier if you keep this tab open because some of the links will still be opening some links later as well. So it'll be easier if you are able to uh, just click on them. Okay, going back to setting up the machine. So once the extension has been installed, uh, that should be about it for setting up the machine. Uh, we will just wait for like about a minute or two, wait for everyone to finish setting up. Uh, if you need a little bit more time, do sound out so that we can make sure everyone is on the same page. If you need help, do sound out as well. Okay, just a quick check. Everyone has finished setting up your machine locally, right? Everyone good? Okay, we will move on. So some things to keep with you, as I've mentioned just now, is definitely this particular slide deck, as some of the links are easier to click if you have it open. And another thing that is very useful for web development is actually the MDN web docs. So it's a set of uh, HTML related, like web development related documentation provided by Mozilla Foundation. So it's a very frequently uh, referenced documentation. We'll be referencing it from it from time to time as well. So let's just start with HTML. So HTML actually stands for Hypertext Markup Language. So it has been, there has been quite a few number of like revisions and like standards. And then uh, in the past decade or so, what everyone has like converged to and then like settled on is the current standard HTML5. It's not exactly like a very uh, static standard. It's a standard that constantly involves, but then some of the basics remain consistent and then it hasn't changed much in like the past decade or so. So we'll be going through HTML and some of the basics first. Uh, okay. So what you see actually on screen here is uh, the NUS Hackers website. So we have like loaded it. And then if you were to right click and then like view page source, uh, this is what you will see. So you see this whole chunk of like unreadable kind of thing. Actually it's sort of readable, but then it's not exactly meant for humans to be reading. That's why your browser is like rendering it for you. So we'll be going through what actually makes up a HTML document. So you can actually open up your VS code and then open up example slash simple page.html. You can actually use it, you can open it in both your VS code and then you can uh, open up your file browser and then uh, open up the HTML file directly in your browser as well. It should render it correctly. So, uh, for example, let me see. Uh, so let's just say I open it up. Uh, a simple pitch open with Firefox. So yeah, it should open up nicely like this. So what you see here, there will be a short message, Hacker School 2020, the end of midterms. Hopefully it's the end of midterms for everyone. And if we were to inspect the HTML document itself, what you will see here is a very, is the most basic structure that a web page will normally have. 
So there are a few elements that I will go through in details later, but this is like the very basic structure that every document will definitely have. So the first line in the document is actually a doc type HTML. So as part of like the HTML5 standard, all the HTML5 documents will actually begin with this declaration so that the, when the browser tries to render, it knows that, oh, this is a HTML5 document. It's not some other standard. So I will render it according to what I know about HTML5. So there are some specifications that uh, for, the, for those who are interested, you can actually go read up about it, but then we will be going through some of the basics today here. And once you have the first line to, of declaration, the other tag that the first element of the day is actually the HTML element. So this thing actually like, uh, HTML is actually very similar to, it's actually based off like XML document. So if you don't know what XML document is, it's a, a kind of like a structured, it's a way of representing like structured data. So every data is actually comes with like text. There is always like, not most of the time there is always a opening and a closing tag. So in this case, uh, for HTML document, you always have a opening HTML tag and a closing HTML tag. So your, the rest of the code will actually be wrapped within this particular section itself. So the next tag, immediately that comes after is the heading. So the heading actually deals with things that are like literally like in the heading. So things like your title, some of the meta information, some things that you should look beforehand. We will see some examples later, but the, head, the, the HTML document actually composed of two parts. The first part is the heading. The next part will be the body itself. So the body is actually the uh, content of the HTML page. So in this case, just now the message that we have just seen, Hacker School 2020, the end of midterms, actually this, this text will actually be in the body itself. The body is what you actually, the browser will render and it's what you see in the actual web page itself. Okay, hopefully the Zoom people managed to settle the issues. And as I, as I have mentioned just now, a lot of the text actually comes in pairs. We will be going through some of the text that actually don't follow this uh, particular standard, but most of the text actually comes in this kind of uh, pairs. So when you have an open tag, it's actually just an angle bracket and like the name of the tag itself. And then normally you will close it with a very similar looking tag, just with another slash right after the first angle bracket. Yeah, so that is the open tag and this is the closed tag. So the heading actually contains like page metadata, like things like title, links to like style sheet. Style sheet is CSS. Uh, we will be uh, going more in depth into that later. So it's a, because the heading is the first part of the document. So normally it's what it, the browser will receive first. So it will try to take any, it will try to render the head first. So like the page title, all these are all located inside. And as I've mentioned, the body contains the page content. And actually a lot of the more complicated kind of structure will actually fall under the body itself, whereby we have a lot of like deeply nested kind of elements. So that's where the majority comes from. So in this case, we have the most simplistic uh, elements in, within stored within the body. It's just plain text and it will just render as however the browser likes to render it. As to how to control what we render, we will go through it in a bit. So another thing to mention is some HTML entities. So you like in this document, you see this very strange combination of like numbers and like some weird ampersand hashtag symbols. So these are actually ways to represent like special characters because uh, HTML, there are very, there are many ways to actually encode like HTML. So your, your document can actually come in many encoding, but then normally if I'm not wrong, actually the standard is to encode it in like ASCII unless it's like, you specify the encoding itself. So like other encodings can be like UTF-8 to represent like a whole other range of like languages. 
but then most of the time by default it falls back to ASCII. So like uh, the ASCII has a very limited uh, character set. So in order to display things like the three dots that you see, uh, we have like special HTML, like special character codes. There are other codes as well, like for example, like the copyright code or this, you can actually look at the reference chart and then you'll be able to see like all the different codes that are available. Uh, the Wi-Fi, the school Wi-Fi is a little slow, so I don't think I will open up too many references. Yeah, I think it loaded up. Yeah, so you can see like a whole bunch of like different characters that you can render. So most of them are like within a Unicode as well, I think. So yeah, if you're interested, you can actually look up this list. Okay, so now we'll go into another variety of different HTML elements. So you can actually follow along by like modifying the simple page.html. Or another way to actually do this is uh, by using a browser. It's actually possible to edit what you see in your browser as well. So for example, if you were to open a browser tab, visit a web page, uh, let's just say you open up the simple page.html, you can actually use like F12 or you can just right click uh, inspect, inspect element on your browser, you should be able to see something similar to the screenshot I have here. This is from Firefox. So if you are using Chrome, it might look a little different, but it should look largely the same. So you are able to, if you double click on like the text here, you'll be able to edit it to whatever you like, and then it will reflect in the browser rendering as well. Okay. So the first element go through for the body is actually the div element. So it's like the div and the span element. These two are like the most generic text for like your content. The main purpose of them, they are sort of like your punctuation in a way. They help you divide up your content. So in a way, there is some sort of uh, separation, but then like it's kind of arbitrary. It's just allow you to easily divide up your content so that it's easier for you to like apply styling, let's say styling to a particular section itself. So if you're interested to know more about the details, you can definitely visit the documentation, but then for the purpose of today's workshop, we won't be going too in depth into the differences. And then some other more common elements and their semantic meanings is like things like uh, paragraph, main, article, header, footer. Uh, the text themselves, uh, although they do commonly represent a particular uh, kind of content, uh, by default, they don't have like any kind of like special styling. Let's just say you type, a, if you enclose like your text with paragraph, it, by default, it shouldn't look any different without the paragraph tag itself. So uh, to do the styling is through the help of like CSS, which we'll be going through later. So things like article, normally if you see like, uh, if you read news websites or this, they will normally have this article tag that like uh, contains the main body of the uh, article itself, whereby the other elements on the news web page will, be, will fall under other kinds of like elements. So there is a very clear separation. And so you might ask like, why are we using like semantic elements if like they themselves don't like apply any kind of styling and then like every, everything like looks the same anyway. So in this case, it's because of like accessibility. So a lot of times, uh, a lot of times these kind of things are like not just processed by like uh, machines. So humans, we can like HTML is like, by right, it should also be like somewhat human readable as well. So with all these kind of text, it's easier to differentiate the kind of content there is. And then another thing to that is useful from the machine side of things is search engine optimization. So a lot of times when you create a website, you want it to have a very big outreach. The main, a lot of times when you have a website, the biggest flow of traffic is normally from Google because nowadays, People don't even remember web addresses. The first thing they do when they want to look for something is to type into the search bar, 
the thing that I want to go to. Like I want to go to Luminous. I wouldn't type like the Luminous web address. I would search for Luminous and then like click on the first link. So in order for search engines like Google to discover your web page, your web page must follow a certain kind of uh, structure whereby all these semantic elements are like things that the search engine will look out for. And then it's things that the search engine will index. And then like based on that, it will uh, calculate the search results itself. So semantic elements, they convey the specific type of data it's carrying. So sometimes there are like different kinds of text that signify like, oh, like uh, this is like a Twitter link. There is a Facebook link to this page or this. So a lot of times it's things that are not really visible, but then it's still embedded into the HTML content. So we go into the title element. The title element is essentially what you see in like your browser, the title of the web page. Normally, now, now it is more like of like tabs. Last time it used to be like one, last time before tabs were a thing, like your browser is just a single window that renders a single page. So like the title will be like the title of the window as well. So for the title element, you have to put it in the head itself. So that is something to take note of. It's one of the few elements that you actually put inside your head instead of the body. So a lot of times, like for example, this is what the search engine will actually show up as the uh, name of the web page itself. So you search for a lot of things, how you control how your web page appears in the, browser, in the search engine, in the search results is through the title. And then like there are other elements you can control the body itself. So moving on, we have like heading elements. So the heading elements is something uh, if you have styled your Microsoft Word documents or like Google Docs properly using like headings before, this shouldn't come as like a surprise. You have like a whole set of different uh, heading elements. Uh, so by right, it, it comes, normally it ranges from heading one to heading six. And then normally they have like different size, default sizes to it. So H1 is like the heading one is like the biggest heading and then heading six is kind of like very tiny. So, and then it's a whole range, uh, but we can definitely control this, the sizes as well through CSS. So yeah, for example, if we were to render the HTML that we saw in the previous page, this is how it would look like. So there's all these different sizes. And next is the paragraph element. So paragraph element normally have this very unique thing whereby like between every paragraph, normally there's a kind of like spacing. So it kind of uh, signifies to the reader, oh, actually this is a very clear cut. There's a paragraph in, this is a paragraph. The other one is a paragraph. So they have a clear spacing. So the whole point of this is to uh, have like very clear designation between paragraphs. And then a bad practice that some people will actually do is to use the uh, BR tag. So this stands for actually break. Uh, it's actually a bad uh, practice to use break to like uh, signify the separation between paragraphs. As much as possible, stick to like paragraphs cause of the styling issues or this. It's easier to control if you use the paragraph. Let's just say uh, next time you want to decrease, you want to like change, you want to remove the spacing between like paragraphs through CSS, you can actually control that like universally instead of using the, if you use breaks itself, you have to like manually remove the breaks. Yeah. So stick to good practices and then you will find yourself in a easier spot when you try to make your HTML page look pretty. Another very common element that we see on web pages is actually list elements. So there are a few kinds of lists. So you have like unordered list, basically your bullet points, and then you have your ordered list, basically the ones that go from one, two, three, four, five. So the way to write them is actually through the unordered list tag UL for short and OL for short respectively. Uh, if you want to write like individual elements, they actually use the li tag even for both like the unordered list and ordered list. So for each item, you enclose them in the uh, li tag itself. So this is the code and then this is the rendered representation of it. So if you want, you can actually try it out and then like have some fun with it. 
yeah, we will be having some actual practice with it later as well. And another one is the anchor element. So a very frequent use of like the anchor element is to actually create your hyperlinks. So for example, this is a hyperlink, this is a hyperlink. So if you were to enclose your tag in this anchor element and you can actually denote like uh, where the hyperlink leads, uh, leads to. So if I were to render this particular anchor element, it will result in this Google thing that normally it will, by default, your browser will normally render it in like blue color. And then like when you hover over it, it will actually show like which link it links to. So the attribute here is like uh, the link itself. So it's like href and then you will have like the link itself so that's how you can control it and so for the attribute this is like uh for every, some of the elements right you can have like all these attribute additional attribute tags so this particular attribute is for the hyperlink and then this this is like the attribute name followed by the attribute value so this is a very common thing that you see uh, within the opening text of a lot of HTML elements. So for example, for things like div, span, all this, later we will see that they also have like some very common attribute that we normally specify together in the opening tag itself. So next, uh, having just text, within your HTML document is actually very boring. A lot of times we are we like to include images. So there is the image tag. The image element is actually a void element. The void element is a class of, it's a whole set of uh, elements that they don't require like the opening and closing. They only have, a, they don't need that closing tag. So if you were to try to close it, uh, I think your web page will appear broken because it's like an invalid way to like write it. Uh, they are like sort of like you can call it like self closing. So just with the opening, the so called opening tag itself is already sufficient. Although most of the time, uh, the standard practice is to uh, put the slash at the end of the opening element itself. So it's kind of uh, to help you recognize that oh, uh, th this element has been closed. So it's kind of like redundant, like although in the official documentation, it says that, oh, you shouldn't include this additional slash at the back, but then most of the time the browsers will ignore it anyway. So it's safe to write it this way. And then it's a helpful reminder that you shouldn't include the additional closing tag. So a lot of times the elements actually, they combine together because each element serves a different kind of a purpose, they have a different meaning to it. Uh, but a lot of times they are like, you can combine them together. So for example, if you have an image and then you have to make your image become a hyperlink itself. So in this case, you can uh, combine these two texts together. So you can enclose like, for example, I have the image of like the Google logo. So like, for example, you, once you write the image of the Google logo, you can actually enclose it within the this particular hyperlink attribute itself, the anchor element. You can put anchor element and inside is the image. So if you were to render this, is this particular button. So like if I were to click on it, it will lead me to Google. I don't think anyone hasn't seen Google before, so I will click on it. So yeah, I have actually went through most of the basic HTML elements. So we will be moving on to actually have some hands-on practice with all the elements that we have seen just now. And then we will come up with your own kind of homepage. Uh, the purpose of coming up with this practice is such that once you come up with your own personal homepage, we will be able to uh, publish this particular homepage. So if you like, you can fill in with like real information so that you the website you create later will be like a bit more realistic and like you can share it with people. And once again, if you don't, if you haven't already opened up this set of slides, it will be helpful to open up this set of slides because there are some quotes later that uh, I'll be uh, sharing with you. So like if you didn't manage to come up with the answer, there is quotes that you can copy and paste as well. So yeah, do open up these slides in a tab if you haven't. I will once again uh, 
paste it in the chat. Hopefully, everyone has it. Okay, so if you now actually we can open up your VS Code, and in this case, uh, to create a new HTML document, you can just uh open up the Explorer tab, and then just right click on like the empty space around here, and then you can just write like new file, and then call it like index.html. So index.html is normally the name that we give to like the default page. So uh, there is some trivia to it. Like why, why is it called like index.html? Because it's like normally it's like the site index that leads to other pages. So like normally it's called index.html. So browsers, like if you if you notice a lot of times when you go to a particular URL without putting anything, uh, the browser will be able to like return you a correct page. But then a lot of times it's because uh, Everyone knows that index of HTML is the default thing to return. So that's why the index will be returned itself. So we will follow the convention and call it index of HTML. And then uh, although you have seen like this whole like boilerplate of like the doc type, the head, the body, all this, you don't have to like type it from scratch with the help of like uh things like VS Code, because once you just type like uh, exclamation mark there is actually like a whole autocomplete function. So this whole boilerplate will be generated for you. So that's a good thing. So you don't have to remember so many different things. So yeah, create your index of HTML and then type an exclamation mark and you should be able to come up with something like this template itself. So now you can like customize the type page title. Like maybe it's your name, like, uh, Abings, uh, uh, homepage. Yeah. There are a few other like uh, meta elements here. Uh, they are actually to help with like the rendering or this, but then you don't need to worry about them too much. Just leave them as default. So yeah, once you have like the basic page, like you can leave the body empty and then you can try to show preview. So if you open up VS Code, you should be able to, once you, if you, I assume that everyone already has the live preview extension installed. So if you have it installed, you can actually press the show preview button. And then let's just say I change this to hacker school 2022. So you see, as I type this, the title of it will change here. So if I change it at 2023, you see that it will immediately render. So do keep this preview open at the side. So it's very helpful because uh, whatever you type, it will like straight away respond like, hi, good morning. Yeah. Yeah, so now you have like the basic editing done. So the first step will be to add your details to this page. So some things you can include is like a profile picture, uh, your name, your occupation. So these are the things that you can include in the body itself. So you can try, you can don't, don't put them in like, uh, like for example, your name, all this, you can don't put them in any elements first, just type it out to have a feel of like how the HTML actually works. And for your profile picture, you can either try to find a real picture or like just Google for some random image and like add it in. I think in the repository that we, the template repository that we have provided, there should be some random images. I think there is this guy <laughs> that you can like use as your profile if you don't mind looking like him. If you do drag in your own images as well. Yeah. So uh if you want, you can like just drag in your own images, just put it under the images directory. Uh normally we don't like put it at the root of the directory because it can be quite messy if you like include a ton of like different pictures all the way, then like the whole directory becomes like very cluttered. So normally we create like an image directory and then like, we throw everything inside. And then in terms of like adding the link, uh 
you can try first. Uh, I will I will show you how to exactly include the image later. So just a couple of minutes, try to add in your own details. I'll be revealing the answers in a while. So if you need help, you can actually uh, go back a couple of pages in the slides to get uh, some of the other elements. So maybe like how the image element is written, like maybe you want to use some heading for your name. Okay, I hope everyone has come up with your very simple page. So I have, as I've gone through just now the boilerplate, I won't show the boilerplate itself because it wouldn't fit on the screen. So one way that you can do this is, okay, so there is now a new kind of uh, element that I didn't introduce just now. So there is this figure, you see this figure tag that actually encloses the image tag itself. So the a lot of times the, the usual practice is to enclose your images in a figure because like within a figure, you can have some other elements that help uh, describe the image better. So normally we enclose it in like the figure tag. So if you don't have a figure tag, just uh, include it. And then this will be very helpful for styling later as well. So you see under the image tag, the most important part is actually the source attribute. So the source attribute, you have to point to the, the path to your image itself. So if your path, if your image is under a directory, you will include like the directory and then like you slash then the name of the uh, file itself. Then you have the alt uh, attribute name. The alt attribute, actually what it does is, uh, let's just say, uh, the browser like is unable to load the image itself, then it will actually load this alternative like uh, description. So it will show up as like, instead of showing the picture, it will show like a me as a placeholder. And then for a lot of times this helps in accessibility as well, because you might have some people who are like visually impaired. And then when they visit your page and then uh, if the, browser is trying to convey like what exactly is in that spot, it will actually try to read out the alt tag. So for accessibility, it's best if you can like include a alt tag. And you can put your name as like a heading one, then like maybe like a student as like heading two, then it should look pretty neat. Yeah, so maybe a few seconds for everyone to like follow something similar. It would be best if you don't deviate too much because uh, while we do uh, while we do encourage some creativity here, but then uh, for the purpose of today's workshop, it will be easier if you follow along, stick to a very similar kind of structure so that during the styling session later, you will be able to like follow more easily. And yeah. So once you are done with uh, adding your personal details, the next part is to actually add a section on like your projects. You can, uh, if you don't have anything that comes to mind, you can just create like placeholder. So to add a section, as the name implies, we will create like a section. Uh, we will open it. We will enclose everything within like a section element. So just open a section tag and then it should, uh, VS Code should help you close it automatically. And then within the section, perhaps if you, for projects, maybe projects are something that are like kind of unordered. So like you have multiple projects, like bullet points are more suitable perhaps. If you want to use like a, a ordered list, if like you have like importance, you can like use a, a ordered list and then just use a OL instead. So within each list item, uh, you can think about uh, including a title. So, you can decide like a suitable heading size for the title and maybe come up with like a little description below. Maybe you can be a bit ambitious and try kind of like a nested list to try to see how powerful nesting can be. Maybe you can have like many, many levels. 
just to have fun with it. Yeah, so VS Code should be powerful enough. You just have to type part of what you want to type. Uh, it should auto suggest, and then like you click on the auto suggestion, it should help you complete the entire tag, which is very helpful because a lot of times you might happen to just forget about closing your uh tag, and then like especially when uh you're writing like a more complicated HTML, things can get very nested. And then it becomes, it quickly becomes like very hard to keep track of which text you have open, which text you have closed. So having a IDE that helps you open and close your text is a uh, godsend. Yeah, you can take this opportunity, play with the different kind of elements you want to include as part of like your project showcase. Oh. Okay, hopefully everyone has come up with something. If you haven't, this is something that you can take reference from. So as mentioned just now, we will create like a section here. And then uh, because we want to have like a list of different projects, we will open a unordered list. And then we can like, let's just say the project is called Fuminers. Uh, then we can have like a list item. And then within the list item, we actually enclosed it in a div tag. And if you don't remember what a div tag is, it's kind of like a natural separation of like content. It's like a divisor of some sort. So it's like a container. It contains all of this. Uh, if you don't have it, do insert it now. So the purpose of this is to help in styling later as well. It's perfectly fine if you don't have it and it should render just fine. So yeah, if you have an image, uh, you can put it. If not, you can just do some of the stock images that we have provided in the repository as well. So I hope this isn't too difficult. Yeah, don't worry if you didn't manage to like catch up so far. Uh, just stay with us and then we'll move on to the next session section and then uh, this time around we will create another section on like testimonials so essentially it's uh, a list of people that you like uh, quote I, maybe someone said something good about you so you want to advertise about yourself so you can give a bit of testimonials so some tips is that uh, it'll be good if like every section has its own like heading. And then we have seen just now for the projects, we had a heading two. So think about what you want to use for this particular section. So if you want to quote someone, uh, one tip is you can try using the block quote element you can try to see what's the effect compared to like, say like a paragraph. You can play around with that. So these practices, just try your best to like create it. If you are, if you are stuck, never mind because we will provide you with a template later. This is more of a hands-on exercise for you to just experiment around and it's probably a lot more intuitive if you try something and like get visual feedback straight away. It's much better than me like describing for like half a day. So yeah, for this particular testimonial section, uh, we can actually, uh, it doesn't have to be really consistent. Like the previous section we used like a heading tool, we use the heading one here for the purposes of today's workshop. It's kind of arbitrary, so it's fine. And then we do see some HTML uh, character code here as well. So 
yeah, so you can have a lot of times when there is special characters, it's best if you don't like include the special character directly because the browser might not like it that much. And then if you include special characters, and uh, if you, you can try including a special character, but then uh, it might render weirdly in your browser. So it's best to stick with the reference uh, codes and then like insert them. And then it's very similar to the previous section whereby we have like an unordered list. Uh, maybe you don't have so many people who are quoting you, but you can just like imagine someone uh, praising you and just come up with a few more. And la, it's largely the same. And then if you use the block quote, you will see like uh, it's actually a different styling. Maybe uh, without the plain HTML for now, it might not look very special, but then later you will see that once we style it, it will be you will have a very different style from like the kind of the, the other text that are available on the page. So here we have like the span elements as well. We enclose like the person giving the testimonial or this. Uh, don't worry about it so much. And once again, it's like just an arbitrary container that we put it in so to facilitate styling later. And yeah, I think we are reaching the end of the web page soon. So where if you create a personal web page, you would definitely want like a way for people to contact you. So say like, your socials or like if you're like a developer, maybe a link to like your GitHub account so you can showcase all your work. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can have some of your friends links, maybe. Yeah, you can link to like Instagram. Maybe you can like try creating a, link to telegram if you are comfortable with like sharing your telegram handle on the web is it a good idea uh, that's not for me to decide all right this should be the last section that we are adding so you can just call it like contact me uh, or just contact and then you can actually give an unordered list of the various uh, links, your contact links. So if you are lazy to like include an actual link, you can actually uh, include like a hashtag that's like kind of like a placeholder link. If someone click on it, nothing will happen. But yeah, you can just leave it like that. So this should be pretty simple section to add. So yeah, I wouldn't, yeah. Once again, it's a lot of nesting in action. Yeah, move on to the next page. Okay, so we are almost ready. Uh, just make sure that you have like at least two main items in like each section uh if you didn't manage to catch any of the previous parts uh don't worry i think there should be a index sample dot html uh yeah at the it's it's not under examples but then under the root of the repository you should be able to find the index sample the html it has most of the it has all the elements that we talked about just now so we do have like about two items per section. So in the unordered list, there's normally like two items. Uh, this is just so that uh, later when we style the web page, it will look nicer. So you can either copy the copy from the template if you want like a, something different and you and you don't want to think about it, or if you want, you can like simply just like duplicate what you have currently and then like make sure there is like two of them. So this will come in very handy later. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm going to be going through the CSS, which is the styling part of this workshop. 
So earlier, what you can't cover was HTML, where it contains all the content of the page itself. Uh, also, you came up with a simple HTML page uh, that might reflect your personal web page that you might want to post later. But it looks kind of Spartan at the moment, right? Um, there's some default styling applied to it. Like you can see the headings, for example, are a little bolder and whatnot. But it's, it looks like something from 1990s. So what we're going to do is to use CSS to uh, control the appearance of the website because that's the role of CSS. Um, and now it's also a good time to deviate to some other topic that is that I didn't make a slide for. But uh, you can consider the three main technologies of the web as HTML, which we have covered, CSS, styling, which I'm going to cover now, and then JavaScript. Uh, so the responsibilities of all them, HTML, content, CSS, appearance, styling, whatever. And JavaScript, the behavior of your website. What happens when you click on a button? Uh, what happens when you mark over something? Uh, okay, that's maybe CSS. Uh, what happens when you, I don't know, press the play button on a particular video kind of thing? Those, those are all the behavior of the site that you can control with JavaScript. Today's workshop will not be covering JavaScript. Uh, there's a subsequent workshop called Introduction to React, which talks about using a JavaScript library for doing some of the things we have done today, but much uh, more efficiently. So if there's something you're interested in, uh, we'll go into more details about that later. But for now, let me just continue with uh, CSS. So uh, created around 1994, I think, which is a few years after HTML was introduced. Um, we are at CSS3 now. Yeah. OK, so about styling. The first thing we can do with styling is to do a uh, style inline. So uh, to do that, we use a style attribute. So style equals to, and then uh, this section. Uh, now uh, the styling that you apply, I'll go, to more, I'll go into more details. Uh, maybe let me do some styling somewhere. Let's see, uh, let's change this to a light theme so it's more consistent. Um, let's open a light review. Okay, yeah. Uh, for convenience, I have copied over index of sample HTML to index of HTML. So this is what I'll be going through for this workshop. Um, suppose my name was uh, Nicholas Lam and I was a full stack web developer. So I would like to apply some styling. Now, currently, I'm going to it's a demo inline styling. So if I zoom in slightly. Is that more readable? Okay, so apply inline styling is uh, what I say on the slide. We have a style attribute, and then we uh, apply our styling inside here. I'm going to apply it to this leakless num heading. So let's say if I wanted to go to the color, uh, and I give you a color, say blue, semicolon. And you can see that leakless num, the leakless num heading is now blue. Oh, that's a helpful. Oh, I didn't know this existed. That's nice. Okay, it looks good now. Yeah. So uh, similar to attributes, right? Uh, in CSS, we call these things properties. So uh, the property, the color is a property, and then to define the value, we separate it by a colon, and then the name of the value. So, and then uh, we don't have to do it now, but we can combine it with a semicolon. that will be more helpful. Uh, so earlier you saw that I typed a uh, blue as a color. But uh, as you saw, when I, when I click on this, you are able to use other values, like for example, uh, RGB values, uh, red, green, blue values. Uh, and VS Code conveniently had this feature to drag around to, to select your RGB values from here. Uh, let's go for a line green. Yeah, okay, it looks really good now. Yeah, so if you, I think it even, in fact, I think it even supports uh, alpha, which is like the transparency level. Let's try something like 0 0.5. Oh, yeah, it actually does. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I'm not going into too much detail for that. Today, we'll have another way of approaching CSS. For now, I'm just covering some fundamentals. OK, we have just gone through the color property. But there are a lot of these properties. Um, I don't remember most of them. Um, but as usual, when I don't remember something about the web, I go to MDN, Mozilla Developer Network, to look at the documentation. 
uh, there will be a list of all the CSS properties exhaustively there. So you can reference all of them there. Some of the most commonly used properties are probably a like color, which uh, you saw earlier with the font color, um, the background color, you can control background color, um, the font face that is used, uh, spacing, the spacing of an element, uh, border margin padding, which I'll go into more detail soon. So um, if you want, you can follow along. Uh, I will slow down this workshop at certain points, like Yuan Kang, for you to play with the properties. So now I'll talk a bit more about spacing. Uh, this was where the quiz uh, paused at earlier. So um, this uh, every element in HTML, like your div, your text one, your span, your whatever, uh, all you can think of all of them as being a box. And you can control this uh, box you're using C with CSS with a few different properties, margin, border and padding. Uh, I'm going to continually ignore permission for this. But all these uh, kind of allow you to control the spacing of your element. So for, uh, for padding, think of it as the internal spacing. Right? Um, suppose this, um, okay, suppose this particular element was uh, a short paragraph, uh, let's say. So maybe all the content, all the text content of the paragraph be inside this blue color region. Maybe I type like normally it's some dollar feet on it inside here. And the padding, which is the purple region, would be like the internal spacing that is applied to uh, the this element. Then you'll be followed by the border, which uh, controls like the outline of uh, this box. Uh, and then the margin will be the external spacing. Uh, if you are familiar with things like, I think, Photoshop, it should also have a similar concept of uh, internal padding and then external like margins around something. So uh, let's have a demo. Um, maybe I will use the H1 again for convenience. Where's Nicholas now? Uh, over here. Let me remove the color. So it's, uh, let me apply some border first. So it would be obvious. So border, um, I can't remember the syntax for border. So let me try like three pixel from it. Okay, so I have applied a three pixel. Uh, let's exaggerate it for teaching purposes, 20 pixel. Okay. Does it come after? Uh, okay, yeah, uh, the order matters. So apparently the size of the border was supposed to come after the, deck, the, the type of the border. So uh, I'm being very simple here. I just use a thick solid border. You can have other border properties. Uh, oh, okay. The line width comes first, followed by the line style. So this is the line style I'm using solid. Uh, this like double bar, vertical bars here, you know that it's optional. So you can exclude whatever if you, you don't want to use it. Uh, I'm using solid over here and then the, that doesn't make sense. Eh? There should be a color, right? Let's try something like pop pink. Okay, so maybe two twenty pixel. Okay, that's confusing, whatever. Okay, so the border obviously is like the border around it. Now, if I wanted to give it some internal spacing, because you see like the words liquid lum, right, are almost like touching the pink border already. Maybe you can give it some internal padding. Uh, I will exaggerate it as well. So padding of uh, 50 pixels. And you can see uh, it evenly spreads about 50 pixels on each side, top, bottom, and left and right. Uh, you get a lot of fine control over the padding as well. So for example, I think length and percentage as well. Let's try this, uh, 50 pixel, 20 pixel. Uh, that did not work as intended. Actually, no, it looks like intended. Let's try 100 pixel. Yeah. Okay, so let's change this to 10. Yeah. So uh, the padding syntax, which will be similar to the margin one, also gives you control. Uh, you can have one value, like 10 pixels, for example, without this 100 pixel. It will be applied to all sides, uh, top, bottom, left, right. Uh, if you have two of them, 
And the first value gets applied to the top and bottom. The second value gets applied to the left and right. And you can go like for all four as well. So like, uh, let's have something really important. So you can do one, two, three, three, seven, six, here, here. Um, and then one, six, uh, over this side. So um, clearly it doesn't look very good, but you, you have control over that. So anyway, this is the internal facing. Uh, I am going to make it just 10 pixel. So we get to, you get more space. And as I said, margin is the external facing. If we look at this like border, um, you can consider this entire unit as the internal spacing. The margin is the external spacing. So if I try to put in some margin now, you can expect that there'll be some space outside here. So you'll be some spacing from say this image of a little num over here and maybe some spacing over here. Of course, you get to control that. Uh, so let me put some uh, yeah, so we, now we get uh, external spacing about 50 pixels on each side. The next and the idea of uh, margin, the CSX box model, uh, adding border margin. And that's how you get the spacing manually for all your elements. Okay, now what if we have a lot of elements? Um, we don't have a lot of everything from here, but suppose we wanted to style all the leaves to say um, the top thing, right? And I have several leaves. Uh, yeah, I have a whole bunch of leaves in this particular document. I can't be going to every single leaf. I think style goes to uh, color hopping, style goes to color hopping, blah, 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 blah. So uh, with all things computer science, we have abstractions to deal with such things. So one thing we can do is we can have a style tag, and then in, inside we define a, a what is going on? Okay, we can have a style tag, and inside that style tag uh, we define a CSS new set. So let me go through the syntax of this CSS new set. So the first thing we do is uh, we define a selector. In this example, P is our selector. So uh, this rule will apply to all the P's, which are paragraphs in our document. So uh, I'll slow down a bit here. So you can, if you want, you can try uh, doing something funky with your example page. So now we are selecting P. And then we follow by a decoration block, uh, which is enclosed inside your curly braces. So this is a thing that you have a selector, and then you have a bunch of curly braces. And then inside, uh, your decorations go inside this curly brace. So in this example, we are going back to color blue again uh, for our decoration. And if you do this, uh, if you have this style tag with uh, this CSS selector and decorations inside your document, you should see that all paragraphs uh, should have blue text in your document now. Actually, can I, can I copy this and then demo it myself? Okay, let's do it after Lithia's now. Copy. Ah, okay, so you can see that the blue text applies to all the paragraphs I have in my document. Yeah, kind of random. Yeah. So, um, That's a good question. I think it does, but we can double check because the CSS rules to apply um, maybe blue text. Yeah, the styling will apply like to all the, the, the things that it selects in the document. So uh, actually this is part of the reason why it's called CSS cascading something, but we will skip that for now. <laughs> yeah. So this is one way you can select things uh, directly by the tag, sorry, the element kind, which is well, in this example, P. The other ways you can select things are via IDs, uh, identifiers. So an ID is this uh, thing that starts with a pound sign or a hash 
or hashtag or whatever, you, you get the point. So uh, IDs have to be unique in a HTML document. So um, suppose I had, maybe suppose I gave this uh, fixed heading one an ID of uh, my heading. I should not have an ID of my heading anywhere else in this document. Like over here, I should not have another ID equals to my heading. Um, it's like an NIC, it's a unique identifier. You should not have duplicate IDs. So when you go call it something else like another, another heading, if you do call it the same, uh, I don't think your browser will complain, but it's invalid according to the HTML spec. And it will cause problems because the whole point of having IDs is you want it to be unique. So when you select it via, say, CSS or you say JavaScript, it will be unique to the element and you just cause problems uh, when you try to do all these things. So remember, ID, ID is unique. Uh, so now I have an ID called my heading, right? So maybe I can style that directly. Uh, style. Uh, so I can select my my heading and color goes to red. That is insane. A Y K not it's copilot, but that's weird. Uh, the specificity. So even though I have a style tag here called my heading that was trying to I was trying to find uh, the color to uh, one We also have inline styling here. No, that doesn't make sense. Just uh, control. Okay, whatever. Yeah. So you need to select something. Uh, we also have after. Those classes are just like arbitrary labels that you find. We start a uh, few. We find class starting to not. Then you give it a, a, any name. Well, uh, almost any. Yeah, you can give it any name, like pretty much. Like for example, okay, find the properties for this class. For this, I'm giving it a name. Yes, just a color red. Uh, we have another class called dot m to set the font weight to gold. Then the way to use these classes that you have defined is to use the class attribute, and then inside you put a lit, the select. Well, the, the names of the classes that you have defined. So in this example, red and blue. So for this paragraph, uh, you should expect that uh, you have both of these uh, styles, color red and font red blue applied to it. So this will be a red full paragraph. So these are some of the most basic ways we can apply styling uh, using uh, CSS styles. Another thing that I'm going to quickly cover to now is uh, CSS units. So uh, you have seen me use uh, PX, uh, which stands for pixel, I think. Uh, there's also another unit called TT point, and also M, which I think stands for M first fist. I'm not very clear on this. So these are uh, different units that you can use. Uh, pixels and point are relative to an inch, and M is relative to uh, the default font size you have for your browser. So, um, I'm not going too much into too much detail about all this for now, but when you dive into more details or, and you or maybe when you look up CSS documentation, you will see these units. So uh, just keep that in mind. And finally, we are able to do styling ex uh, separately in another file, like for example, a CSS file. Um, I'm going to create one uh, in the in this uh, folder. Maybe I'll call it style, uh, my styles.css. And then I can put some styling inside. For example, I'm going to select this, and then I'm going to put a background color, um, aqua. So now I have an external style sheet file called my style.css. Then I can include this uh, file um, using a link, a link element uh, with a rel called style sheet, and then also a high pitch ref attribute where I can reference my uh, style file. After I do that, if it didn't mess up, I should expect, yeah, I should expect that all my list items have 
and upper background. So it works as intended in this example. Uh, yep. So this is the syntax, and we are going to include an external style sheet, and we are going to be using it again later. Oh, it's also helpful to declare the type. It's not necessary, but it's helpful to uh, declare the type that is uh, CSS. So uh, what we have covered now, uh, we have covered inline styling by using style attribute. We have covered uh, a bit of the CSS box model, Martin border padding. We have covered uh, using style tag, and we have covered uh, linking using external and external style tool. But um, I would claim that um, this page still doesn't look very pretty as of now. And if you have to start all this by hand, it's going to take a while and it's rather tedious. So um, one way you can get around this is you can reuse styles that other people have really helpfully created for us. And then um, it will be faster to get a nice looking page from there. So today, I'll introduce a CSS library called Puma. Uh, named after the Dragon Ball character. I think it's the wife of the Gita, called Buma. I, I could be wrong. I'm not very familiar with Dragon Ball. Yeah. But anyway, this is a CSS library. Uh, it kind of looks like this out of the box uh, in this example site that I have embedded. Uh, it comes with a lot of helpful styles, like buttons. Um, it, it reasonably looking in input. Uh, ways to lay out your data, so ways to lay out your content, like for example, these things I guess kind of look like cards, and yeah. So today we'll. Oops, and I think a slide is missing. Sorry, let me refresh this. Okay. Uh, it, it's fine. We'll, we'll just continue for now. So uh, I'm going to quickly, quickly class lay out the data. Like for example, uh, it comes with a uh, task for us to quickly design something that looks like this. It's uh, called media content. We get image, then like a label, and then some content inside and some icons. So it also comes with some helpful code that you can directly copy and then modify it as you desire. Um, so that's the layout. Uh, it also comes with like column-wise layout, so you can declare like you can wrap things in multiple columns. Like say you wanted a three-column layout conveniently. Uh, we'll probably cover this later in the demo. It comes with a hero class for you to design a giant hero banner like this, uh, which is uh, this giant image that you see in a, in a lot of landing pages. Uh, <laughs> Right. So, uh, so earlier the document, the currently the document has this three of uh, semantic element sections and other these headings, uh, images that inside figures. Uh, unfortunately for Buma, um, Buma uses classes, which is our link. Classes. So Buma is but um, the trick of apply a lot of these classes, you have to get them to different functions. And then you just create a list containing that class to grab all your content that you have up to now for to do your styling. Uh. So um as we walk through the, the example later, you'll be creating a lot of these, but it should be it should still be fine uh for say a uh, web for a web crawler to index your to go to a site for content. Uh, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, another thing that Buma provides is easy integration with icon fonts. So you have probably seen your share of like mini mini icons all over whatever particular page. Uh, there is another um, library called Font Awesome, which we are going to be using today to integrate with Buma to create a lot of icons to show over our example page. So um, icon fonts are also something that are very convenient to use, and we'll be touching on that later. So I just quickly went through some of the things that Buma has. Um, the documentation is rather exhaustive, um, and we 
and quite re- and very readable in my opinion. So there's no point in me like just rehashing the documentation in my slides. So instead, let's just go to the base link. Part of IO slash documentation slash start. Uh, I think right here. Uh, on your site, where we are going to use just one line from here. Um, uh, yeah, sure. For convenience, I, I, I don't think I'm going to do any too much styling by myself today. So um, if you wanted to use an external style sheet like you had, you have left uh, my style for CSS, what you could do is you use this option one, where it helpfully gives you a CSS add import to copy into a CSS file that you already have. So for example, uh, my style.css, where you can paste it there, and it will import Buma for you. Uh, I'm going to use the other CDN option, which is the HTML link tag that we covered earlier to import style sheet, and directly paste it into my head section. And I expect that once I, okay, even before saving this file, you can see that my page has changed. So uh, Buma has applied like some default styling to this page. Additionally, another thing that I want is a font of them so that I can include all my icon fonts. Uh, yeah, one thing you can do to reach a font awesome uh, CDN, a content delivery network, where it, they nicely bundle out the font awesome files for you. So you can just directly include it. Is to Google like font awesome CDN. Uh, CDNJS is a uh, reasonable website to use. So you click on uh, CDNJS and then it should. These are all um, font awesome link for you to embed. I'm going to copy it directly into my HTML document. So I am going to click on this second option to select the link tag. And then I'm going to paste it directly into my head as well, which will create a link style sheet. Um, you see that nothing has changed because I haven't we haven't put place any icon in this document, but we should be able to use one of them now. In fact, um, on this topic, let's try using let's try putting icons for our links now. So we have four uh fake links, uh LinkedIn, Twitter, GitHub. I think Fall Awesome provides some links. Sorry, I, I think Fall Awesome provides some icons for these four companies. So let's try to change. Um, do we have? Do we have GitHub? Yeah, we continually have a GitHub icon. So um, if you click on, if you launch one of them and you search for GitHub and you find the icon that you want to use and you click on it, it will show you uh, the HTML that you can use to embed the icon inside. Um, let me try pasting it directly into one of these links, maybe GitHub, and see what happens. Ah, yeah, it's kind of small, but you can see at the bottom here, we have a tiny little GitHub icon over there. Um, so let me quickly just copy LinkedIn, Twitter, and Overflow if I can. Uh, if you want to follow along, let's go ahead. I will pause a bit. Ah, I'm going to cover that the next step. Uh, you can just click on this uh, to copy the code snippet. But...
Okay, so now um, I'm assuming most of you have copied some icons into your links if you had them set up. Um, you can see that our links at the bottom here still don't look particularly nice. So uh, one thing that I was thinking of starting them with is using buttons to give them like a button wrapping around. So it's not clear that this is an entire link. So I remember, I know that Buma has uh, built-in styles for buttons. I think it's under elements or components. I'm not very really sure. So I'll go to the Buma documentation. And it seems like it's under elements. So I'll click on button. And then, so this demo is the default style. And then over here is the HTML that you need to generate a, a button that looks like this. So you can see in this example, it's using the button tag, which just has the class button applied to it. So what, as I said earlier, Buma is like a class-based CSS library. So we will be seeing a lot of class equals to something when we try to apply Buma styles everywhere. Uh, I'm going to scroll down a bit to see if there's any nicer looking buttons. Uh, longer cover. Oh, I like this. Okay, I think I'm going to copy a code for this because it looks nice. So I'm assuming it's one of these. So looking at the code, I think it's one of these. Uh, so we have a button of class button and then a span of class icon. So, and then we have the icon itself, which seems different from what we copied, but it's fine. Yeah, so it seems like Buma also has a helper class for icons to grab your icon. Uh, let's see the behavior of that now actually. So I'm going to try. I'm going to grab icon. Okay, after wrapping like the icon in a span, it seems like it gives it some a bit of spacing around the area, which I think looks quite reasonable to me. Then um okay, so I think now I want a button. Um, I think I don't need to create a button. I can probably apply the style directly to the history, to the anchor element. So let me try. Okay. Yeah, but this looks kind of fun. Let me try. I can use something. Hey, kind of wonky. Yeah. No, uh, I think the styling due to the icon styling. Other than a weird bit of spacing issues, um, I think they look fine. Uh, I'm not. I remember there's a proper way to deal with this, but I couldn't, I can't remember how to do it as of now. So let me just use this opportunity to introduce uh, another feature of Buma, which is to control spacing directly. Uh, I remember Buma has a helper section, which gives you some ways to control spacing. So uh, right now, I feel like the icons are a little too close to the text I want for uh, this button. So I think I want a bit of margin to the right side of the button. So uh, Buma provides like margin classes. So uh, the syntax goes like this, M or something like, uh, for me, I think I want some margin to the right of this icon. So I would use, according to the documentation first, I would use M and R. Okay. I put that. And then, so uh, this is another value. Uh, we used M earlier. This should be red. This is relative M. Uh, again, don't worry too much about this. You need. You can just experiment with it. So I think I'm going to try applying it to the icon class and then see if it works as intended. So I want some margin to the right. So I type M R for margin right, and then I'm going to see uh, two units. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think it's 
be a story with me, but because uh, I didn't, I didn't think through this very, very much. Uh, I'm going to use manual margins using Puma's helper class to apply some margins to the right of this item. So um, let's look at example. Let me just grab my other icons, bring an icon with Martin right. Manually. And then uh, I'll, I'll wait for the rest of the workshop to catch up. Or maybe you already have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now. So I'm going to talk a bit here, and then if you're following along, I'll, I'll let you type out the rest of this. Uh, I edit uh, three lines at once. So um, I'm using I'm using a, a Visual Studio Visual Studio Code extension to do some of the typing things that I'm doing. But if you don't have that installed, why do you have to uh, you can come out with first? So uh, hey, you can hold down the alternate key, I think, and then click on where you want to create another cursor. So let's say I want to create a stack, multiple cursors here and click and click and click. Then I can do something like, uh, then when I start typing, it will apply to all of these cursors. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, I think the spacing for these buttons looks nice, but I, if possible, I would want them to be all like on a single line and then in the center of the page. So I think that looks kind of nice. So um, I remember Buma had a uh, way for me to create a single level of item. Uh, a single level of content. Um, I'm not sure where it is, so I think it's called. Uh, I what does it look like? Okay, yeah. Um, it looks like this, a centered level. So let me. I I I want something like this, but for all my links to be on one a single level and all centered. So I'm going to take a look at the HTML here. It seems like it's using a wrapper called a nav with the class level. And for each item, uh, I wrap it in a class level item. And You know, I'll apply the class to be level. Um, yeah, it already appears on the level, but it doesn't look very nice. Let me try modifying the list. I'm using the multiple cursor now. Yeah, I demo earlier to continue. Uh, level item has that kind level. Level dash item has that kind of Yeah. Reasonable to me. Um, I might want a bit more spacing for this level. Um, I remember Buma has a nice way to automatically apply space, but I can't remember it now. So I'll just do the manual way to apply margin. So maybe margin top. Uh, so yeah, I'll be trying now. And then maybe uh, learn as well. Maybe. So just some arbitrary spacing. Okay, uh, so I I test with you for now. 
that's the one that I have for you. Okay, uh, what do you have for you again? When you look at the amount of all the before starting for the hit things, right? Okay, that's the idea. So, can you just jump around? I got a bit of 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 a Okay, uh, that looks slightly better. Um, maybe this can be a subtitle, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump around my document and see whether there's any things I want to apply a title to. Um, so maybe I will apply a title to this project. Uh, and um, as well. Oh, I didn't cross it, so it's broken. That's time though. Um, that's time though. Ah, okay. And maybe I'll apply subtitle to this tool instead. And for the project, project itself, I will apply the title class. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that was the motivation to fix all this because we want to use the default styling for this. Um, uh, let's move on. This uh, uh, this starting section with my with uh, reverse face and is uh, this uh, row. So, um, remember I mentioned that so row uh, now, right? I would like for this to be inside a giant channel to be introducing that this is my personal page. So, as I mentioned, Mama has starting for hero, so I think it's in layout. And the object of hero. Um, so I think there are some examples, examples of a, hero, a giant hero family. This looks kind of small. I mean, this looks kind of small. There's a bigger one somewhere. Okay, this looks nicer, I think. Large looks nice. I think I might go with large. Oh, so height. So height. So height looks too big, I think. Okay, um, this looks nice, but it's too fancy. Okay, I think I'm just going to go with uh, a large hero and I'll see if it turns out. So it seems like we have we apply a hero and it's large, and then we have our content inside a hero body. Okay, I guess we can do that. So uh, the first thing I do is to convert uh, this section into the I think how to here. So I guess I'll write in the section called hero uh, is large. And for convenience, I'll put this info as well. Um, and wrap in a section. Okay. Seems like it's already applying the starting. Um, this thing looks quite wonderful. 
because I think I like, still need the So this is when we start introducing more things into our so this one, um, it looks very broken. Let's close this down at the bottom, is it? Yeah. Right. Um, this means a level, I think, but I would call them more the center this content instead. I remember Buma has a helper class called Champagne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I think uh, a container should. Okay, yeah, Buma has a class called Container. Let's just try wrapping it inside and see what happens. Your body. What? That just happened. And then, uh, uh, give me a moment. I have some error in my history now. Um, uh, in line 61. Okay, this should be a H2 instead. Okay. Uh, it seems like it's center line. It, it, it has more spaces to assign now. But I don't think the container did what I want. So I think I'll make only center everything instead. Um, what I can do is, I think I'll use a level again. And then um, just for the image, yeah. And then I'll wrap this in a level. I'll wrap the I'll put the entire figure and the image in a level item, which will be covered previously. And also add a test text sent groups as text centered inside the. Yeah, so now it's kind of centered. Um, Okay, that takes a lot of spacing. It looks kind of funny, but it works. Maybe I will. I think I want to round the results because this image looks very sharp. And I remember Mama has a helper class for this. Other, maybe. I mean, is it image? Okay, Mama has helper class to work with images. Um, it seems like. You can look on size. Okay, how does this work? I can apply an image class to uh, the figure that's wrapping it, and then I can apply an each rounder class to the image. So let me give that a try. Um, the figure should have an image class. And then the image itself should have a each rounded class. Okay, it looks reasonable, I guess. Um, now that I look at it, um, this large seems to take up too much space. Maybe let me change to its medium. And, okay, I think for, because I'm putting it to the side, it looks better this way. I'm just going to continue with this, this medium for this workshop. I think I want to center both of these texts as well. So I'm just going to use the class uh, as text centered for both of them. And uh, it's not amazing, but I feel like I'm satisfied with this for now. Um, also, I'm running a little bit, so I'm going to cut this part short for now. <laughs> yeah. So I guess um, I'm, I'm satisfied with the landing. Maybe I'll try styling uh, the testing modes for now. Um, I think I have a very clear idea of what I'm going to do with this, but maybe I'll apply a subtitle to this thing. So this uh, section, people are going to say this about me. Um, so it's a paragraph which is kind of weird, but I'll just apply the style of a subtitle. And maybe I want to center this text as well, so I'll apply the hashtag center style again. Um, kind of wonky. So I wonder if I had the section class to the section, will I get a bit of spacing in the sides? Okay, yeah, I do. And it's not amazing again, but I'm satisfied with this for now. So um, the concept I have, now I think I want to style a 
these testimonials from many the Indonesian people. So the concept I had is to put them in cards. Uh, because I know when we the documentation, I realized Buma has cards. I think it's inside components. Yeah, Buma has a card component which uh, allows you to do something like this. So I think I want to apply the card styling to the testimonials and I want to see how it looks. So uh, I guess I'll get started on that. So it seems that I have to map multiple private and multiple thieves. Uh, so the outer one, which should be this, is a card. There's also a helper class for card image, a helper class for card content. Okay, uh, that's good enough for now. I think I'll follow that. So maybe the list item itself can be used as the card. Uh, I'll just use this new class. It's class equals to card. Um, it already applies a funny looking card around the area. Um, for the image itself, I think I will be in a card image. So, class equals to card dash image. Um, this should go to the pen. Um, it doesn't seem to have a very big change. And then I think the block code and these two uh, name and the role of the person will probably go inside the other thing, which is a card content and media. So I need two closing this to clean this up. Uh, it looks absolutely horrendous at the moment. Okay. What can I do about this? Problems. This item. So I still think this image is too big. I think I would want to resize it. So um, I remember we covered uh, using the image class. So let me wrap this in an image. And I remember Bruma has a purpose for the resolution. Elements image. Yeah, so I can control the resolution. Um, let's try is 256 by 256. Is dash 256 by 256. It still looks really huge. Did I tell you correct? Is there even a 256 by 256? Maybe, how can I? Maybe if I try, it's 128 by 128. Uh, ah, okay, now it's tiny. Okay, I guess it's 256 by 256 doesn't exist. Um, It's okay. Maybe we can manually do this sizing later. So I guess this is not helpful, so I delete it for now. Now we have all this text, which I don't think looks very nice. Maybe I will want to put uh, the name and also like this book. You know, like itself. Um, I'm lazy, so I just changed them to paragraphs for now, which I think is still reasonable. Uh, unfortunately, Buma ignores that. So I guess I'll try starting manually. Um, I remember Buma has uh, helped us from type the thing. So let's kind of skim through. Uh, we have classes to control the size of the font. Um, responsiveness, which I'll see for now. We have a missing text center that's just by left and right. Uh, what else does it have? Uh, to capitalize the it's uppercase or italicize it. Um, I think for the code itself, because it's a block code, I think I would want to italicize it. So I would want to apply the is italic class. So, yeah. Um, 
for the code itself, maybe I will want a slightly larger font. Um, so one thing I can do is probably yeah, it's size five, so it's slightly bigger. Yeah. Oops, I deleted the code. Okay. Uh, I actually think that's too big. And I think I would want to center the content itself. So I'm going to center the content for everything. So it has text center applied to all of them. Now oh, I want all of them. Maybe I want to see the little computer. So I will apply the class um, somewhere here. Has text made. Semi bold might be fine actually. Let's try semi bold. Okay, that's still reasonable. But I don't want them to be on the same line. Hmm. See, because. Okay, yeah, uh, I guess the media class will be demo on the same line. So after we have something like that. Uh, okay, uh, it's, again, it's not really fun, but I'm satisfied with it for now. I think I'm just going to be allowed to apply this class to uh, the other testimonial by being too strong. And now it's only going for me to pass a bit and then uh, we can do it on it. Um, uh, Yeah. Okay, one last thing that I would like to do, right, is uh, if possible. I, I think I want to make these cards a bit smaller and side by side in the page itself. So, um, as I mentioned, Mark has helpful classes for this. Uh, I think it's called a column to create for you to create a column layout. So, if I did, yeah, it looks like a case. So, um, I could put my card in one column on each side, I think. So, the way I mentioned this is, I think I will do. I wouldn't really want both cards to take up the entire width of the entire of the container that is in. I want it to be slightly smaller. So maybe I would there's probably some way for me to control the sizes okay. Really. Yeah. I think I would be happy if um I was one character of the column. Yeah, let me give that a try. So it seems like to do that, I need to write it in a columns class. And then for each of my time, I want me to write them in a column, I think. And then I will move the size. So let's try that. Um, that should be probably inside. Actually, let's try the columns class that I really will order. Another list. And for each of the list items, let's try adding the class of uh, column. Okay, yeah. I guess they are in the same, yeah, and then another class of column here. So by default, I think they should take up the same column size. Uh, I am, actually I'm satisfied with how this looks for this side tiling. If I adjust this a bit, it might still look funny. Yeah. Okay, funny. Uh, maybe I want to specify a specific move for this. 
I remember I can manually control the size using one of these is fifth. But I wouldn't want it to be, oh, it's actually responsive somehow. It's nice. Okay, I, I'm saying sorry, but I don't think I would manually control the size of this. But I want to give it some spacing to the side. So maybe I'll just add another empty column. Um, Or maybe if I were an offset, can I add a gap? What does gap do? Oh, the gap is the gaps in between the columns. Um, options, maybe. Vertical alignment, multi-line, center row columns. Oh, I actually want to center this column. Um, actually, I'm, I think I'm certainly satisfied with this. Um, there is still an entire section I haven't gone through. I have like demo study for it. Uh, I was intending to use, I think I was intending to use cards again, but in general, I hope you have the general idea of how I was using the earlier, which is uh. Well, obviously, I skipped through the step of looking at all the people that you mentioned first because I really done the info on that in social. But what I did was, uh, I did some kind of study exists in the Google library. Um, I did the like, examples that I provided, and then I applied those uh, classes to the, the document itself. And then I went around and see whether, see whether it's something that I'm satisfied with. I'll um, just apply one last study to. So that means, you know, in terms of time, I think I will not cover um, starting this uh, major project section. Uh, An example style file can be found in the examples folder uh, inside style.html. Uh, I think if I just drag it out now and then we try to open this file. Um, so, start. Yeah. Uh, I was intending to have a page that looks something like this. This is so wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I was intending to come with something like this. But I think I'll stop now. Uh, we are running a bit over time. And the next section is about hosting, which I think it will be more useful, which is quite useful to all of you, I think. So I'll commit it here for now. Okay, so just now we have like came up with the web page and then uh, you notice that you have this URL that you can even open up in your browser itself so you can preview it in the browser. But the problem now is uh, if you want to share it with your friend, they are unable to access it because this particular IP address here, it just means your local computer. Only your local computer can, ex can have access to it. So how do we like make this accessible on the internet? So this is what we'll be covering in the hosting basic session. Uh, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, I think we are running out of time, but yeah. So what we'll be introducing today is the concept called static hosting. So we are hosting like static web pages. It's very suitable for web pages that are generally just informational and isn't like very tailored to the visitor itself. So there are, there are services like GitHub, Pages, Vercel, Cloudflare Pages, Netlify, all this. The advantage of using this kind of services to do the static hosting is that it's serverless. It, you don't have any infrastructure to care about. You don't have to worry that you have to, oh, I have to like go rent a server. I have to go set it up, all this. You have no none of these worries. And it scales very well because these companies, they have all the resources to automatically scale. Let's say suddenly there's like a million people visiting your web page within a day. Uh, all these services will like scale without any issue. So there will be, a, we will now go through a very, very quick example on how to set up using GitHub pages. It's really fast and simple, I promise. Uh, like you can finish it at most within like 10 minutes. So uh, just now we have went through all the exercises. You can actually try to save your ch changes now. First by like opening up VS code, your VS code uh, at the side, you see the source control that uh, three circles and some squiggly lines in between that source control. 
uh, you can click on it and then you can click the, there is a changes section. You just click plus so that all the files that you have made changes to so far will all be like selected. And then in the message box, you just uh, put in a suitable commit message. Uh, it, it, the content doesn't matter for now. And then you can press on the commit button. So what this will do is that you automatically just save the changes. Uh, it's like, uh, it's like kind of like saving it as the document and committing it into the Git history itself. Uh, we won't go into like the Git details, but this will allow us to like push all these changes that you have made onto GitHub. So this should be a very quick step. Uh, ideally, what you should have done until this point is that uh, whatever version of the web page you have uh, created, uh, save it as the index of HTML and make sure that is being selected as part of the committed changes. So just a couple more seconds for everyone to just uh, perform the changes and commit it. Then the next step would be to push all these changes to GitHub because what you have done so far is all safe locally. And then what we have done in the previous step is to like package it as like a commit. So it's like a set of changes. This set of changes, we need to push it onto GitHub. So we are just telling the GitHub site that, oh, I have made all these changes. Now you synchronize with all these changes that I have made. So to do that, it's pretty simple. There is this three dots at the corner that you just press and then there will be the uh, push option, then this will automatically push everything on the GitHub. So as promised, there is no uh, Git CLI involved today. So it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, this, this of course assumes that when you clone the repository, you use like the built-in tools to like connect with GitHub and you have sign in everything. So if you have already been able to push it to GitHub, once everything like pushes over, like if you were to open up like say your particular uh, repository, you should be able to see like there is a very recent commit that should just say like a few seconds ago or, or like a few minutes ago. So the, the commit count should increase as well if you're using the template. And then, um, so once you go back to the page, uh, by default, you will land on the code page, the code tab. And then what we will need you to do now is to go on to the settings tab. So under the settings tab, you will actually see the pages section. Uh, just click on it and then you will see like GitHub pages. Then there will be like build and deployment. Where is the source? Where is the branch? All this. And for this step, what you can do is actually you select under source, you choose the option deploy from a branch. And the branch in this case, uh, you can select below. That will be the master or like main branch, depending on your GitHub settings. Nowadays, like master and main, like are the two main options. Uh, you should only have one of them. And then uh, as for the directory, you can just safely click on the, just the option with just a slash. That, is, that means the root directory. So uh, the pages that we deploy, uh, it will serve from this particular directory onwards. So like to look for index or HTML, it will look for this particular folder. If like, let's say you have another project that you put like the website content in like another directory, like let's say uh, web pages, the, the directory is called web pages, then you will select like web pages so that GitHub pages will know to look for the index or HTML or like any other files within the directory itself. So for this case, we just select root and you can just click save. Once you have done that, uh, you can hop over to the actions tab. So you will see that under the build and deployment, there is one, one single action. You click on it and then you land on a page that is similar to this. So there will be some processes that are running. So what this process is doing is that GitHub will go look at your repository. It looks at all these files, then it will try to like, uh, build it so it will like consolidate all the files that is needed to publish the website. It will like gather all of them. And then once you see the build finish and like all these things finish, under the deploy section, there will you will see like a hyperlink. The hyperlink should be something like 
your GitHub ID .github .io slash your repository name, whatever name that you gave to the repository when you use the template just now. So you click on that link, I think you would instantly land on your particular page itself. So it's as simple as that, your website will now be live on the internet. You pass it to anyone, you can view it on your mobile phone, you can like share it with like the person beside you and then like they will be able to access it no problem. So up to this point, is there anyone who has any difficulties publishing their website? Hopefully everyone is able to, uh, I don't see any questions from Zoom. So yeah, as promised, like you have your website deployed in like under 10 minutes. It's as simple as that for static uh, web hosting. So yeah, so from now on, because we have now published the website, uh, if you were to repeat the process of like modifying your web page, and then you follow the same process of like committing and then pushing to GitHub, the same steps that we have seen just now, uh, you just have to wait for a couple of minutes and then the live website will actually update as well to reflect what changes you have made onto the repository. So this is like a continuous integration, which is very convenient. Yeah. So there are quite a lot of things that you can try. Like for example, notice how like the web address now is like your id.github.io slash your repository name. This is not say very pretty. Like most of the time we want like our github uh, id.github.io and then like you want to directly land on your page so that people don't have to like figure out what's your repository name. So it's actually possible to drop the last part, but then it's uh, in the interest of time, we won't be covering it within this particular session. So I have left a link inside the guide. So like, if you want to figure out how, or let's say you have like, uh, you have gone home and then like you have like uh, came up with an improved version of your website, you have worked on it and then you like, really want to publish it. And then like you want a nice URL for people to access. You can check out this guide on how to like remove the last part. And going a step further, uh, in future, you might want to have like personalize it to put your own domain. Like let's say your first name, last name, dot dev or like dot com. You can like, it's actually possible to do it as well. So I will briefly go through what it takes to actually uh, achieve that. So before we go into like the dom customizing the domain part, so I just want to like uh, give awareness about the various kinds of hosting that are actually possible. So we have just shown you what is a static uh, site hosting. It's just one of the many ways that we can put a website on the internet. So there are many other different methods. Like there are like shared hosting whereby like you rent a, a hosting services from someone who like hosts a server and then like let many people like use the same server. Then there are like application hosting. So things that are like in the very distant past, there's like Blogspot, then like with more recently there's like WordPress, all these like they have all these like CMS content management systems. So those are like different ways of like uh, application that someone can host for you or you host it yourself. And then another way is like virtual private server. It's a more DIY style. So you have to like configure your own like web server that, that is quite complicated. It's not for the faint of heart. There is quite a lot of details to take note of. So it's not suitable for everyone. But then the advantage is that you get a lot more control over like how your web page is served. Like what is the software stack you can use behind. So there are many, many more, and then we are only covering like the tip of the iceberg today. Hmm. Yeah. This, I'm covering it now. So uh, done. we are done with the hosting. So now uh, everyone is interested, like how do I put my like own domain? I want to customize my own URL. Like let's say there is nushackers.org. How do we even obtain it in the first place? So just a little, uh, very quick uh, crash course, like a two minute crash course into like what uh, the domain name system is, is essentially your phone book to the internet. So for those who haven't taken like networking modules or like you're not from CS, uh, so whenever you type like uh, google.com, uh, what your computer will do is it will try to convert it into an IP address. So on the internet, the IP address is what that, everyone contacts everyone by. So like when you call like a phone number, you're going to your contacts, you click on the name 
and then you will call that person. But in actual fact, you're calling a particular number. So it's actually the same concept. It's just that this is more like distributed and hierarchical. So there's a whole system uh, involved in like how this conversion from like the domain to IP address actually works. I wouldn't like really go into the specific details. Of course, if you are interested, I can take like the relevant networking modules. Uh, I will just give like a quick uh, intro into like a few like common DNS records. So like there is the A record, there's the four A record, I missed out the A here. So the A record is like, uh, it points to an IPv4 address. So like uh, nushackers.org, if you look at the A record, it will be a IPv4 address and a four A record will be an IPv4 address. And one very important one is perhaps a C name. It's called a canonical name. So it redirects from one domain to another. So it's like a alias or a shortcut of some sort. So like I can have like NUS dot or pointing to like say uh we can have like another domain like let's say we have a GitHub pages. We want to point it to the GitHub pages instead. So I can use something like a canonical canonical name. So the C name itself, it will be able to like do this like equivalent kind of matching. So if I look for NUS hackers .org, I will know that oh it actually points to github.io. Then I will go figure out where what is the IP address of github.io and then like access the website from that. So if you're interested, you can go read up more about it. So here comes the most exciting part. How do you get your own domain? So there are several ways to do it. Of course, uh, the money works, the makes the world go round. So if you have the money, you can definitely do it. So under the domain name system, there is this whole category of people called the domain registrar. So what they do is actually help you register your domain itself because you need to like, uh, there is a whole process of like submitting the processes, all this. So like the registrar is like sort of like the middleman. So you tell them, uh, I want like, let's say I want yongkang.io. I'll ask them, oh, I want to register yongkang.io. Is it taken? It's not taken. How much is it? Oh, uh, maybe like 10 USD per year then they will actually like, you pay them the money, they will go like settle some of the background work and like register with like the backend system or this. So there are a few uh, domain registrar that I personally like, I think they are like more trustworthy. So like Cloudflare is one of the domain registrars. There is things like some very popular ones like Pogban, Name Silo. They, those are the more cheap ones. Uh, try to look for the cheaper kind of like domain registrar and they should give you a better value for money because like no matter which register you go to, they, and then you want to register a domain, uh, people, different register might charge you different prices, but at the end of the day, you get the same exact thing. So just go for the cheapest. It doesn't really matter. Of course, if you just want to start out and then like you want to just play around, uh, the GitHub student developer pack does have a few offers. Like they have, off, they have collaboration with things like Namecheap or this, that, can allow you to get the domain for free for like a year. So like once the year is over, then you have to start paying the relevant registrar a certain amount of money per year. Yeah, and it's pretty simple to do it as long as you are willing to fork up money, yeah. There are like uh, hosting services located in like Singapore who will like uh, help you host everything. And then like, you don't have to care about the servers or this. Of course, the more service that uh, you want from people, the more you have to pay per month. So the more DIY you do, the less you have to pay. And then like, yeah, so it depends on your needs and then like how much budget you have. And then uh, included in the GitHub Student Developer Pack, you do have a few resources, like there are a few services that are available to do this kind of like web page hosting for you as well, that as a student, we can all like enjoy for free. Yeah, so and a side note is that GitHub Pages allows you to actually point your own domain at their IP address for free. So like instead of like your GitHub username dot GitHub dot IO, you can actually, uh, let's just say you like for myself, I like register, let's say yongkang dot IO, like I want to point it at GitHub Pages. I can actually do that. So there are, you can just Google on how to do this. And then like, it's actually, there's a very simple guide to doing that. But that's beyond the scope of today's uh, lesson. And in the interest of time, I don't think I'll be covering the HTTPS uh, because now if you visit your own website, right, you will notice that it also automatically has the HTTPS really. So in this uh, day and age, uh, HTTPS is like very important because like, I think at some point, like HTTP websites will be like kind of like phased out. And then like, whenever you visit, there will be some random warning, the scary warning that tells you, oh, this site is not secure or whatsoever. So the best is like, you ensure that your website always has HTTPS. 
So that's about it. And where do you go from here? So what we have created is just a static piece of website. It's not very uh, dynamic in the sense that uh, it, you can't customize it. You can't like provide like uh, user specific data. So uh, if you're interested in this, uh, we'll be conducting the React workshop next week. And then two weeks from now, we'll be doing like a Flask workshop. So uh, signups will open soon, but then if you are subscribed to our NUS Hackers Telegram, you can, we will be publishing the signup links there and hopefully we'll see you around there for the next two weeks. Yeah. And a note on like HTML, you might find that just now the whole exercise of like writing HTML, uh, customizing the CSS, all these things is like very tedious and like very time consuming and like very error prone. So like nowadays it's actually very rare that we uh, write HTML by hand when we develop all these uh, web applications. So a lot of the times we use, we make use of like uh, JavaScript libraries to write like components in JavaScript that will dynamically uh, generate all these HTML such that you, uh, you can just focus on the logic instead of the actual like writing of the HTML itself. So yeah, we will be going through uh, React. And then for CSS, there are like some other fundamentals that if you really are interested in like web development that you should find out things like Flexbox, the, block, the box model in detail. Of course, it's like a huge range of things to explore. And then like we have only touched like the very, very basic intro. So it's all up to you to explore. Yeah, and whenever you need help, uh, you can just go to the MDN tutorials or like documentation. There are a lot of very comprehensive details inside there. And of course, the best way to like uh, pick up web development is definitely to experiment. The more you experiment, the more it gets to you and then like you'll be able to internalize it better. So hopefully everyone has like a good starting point now and then you can like uh, bring home the template that you have today and like customize it to all your, to your own needs and like put up your own website to like display your own portfolio. So like, even if you are not like in CS or anything, having your own website actually adds a lot of like credibility to you. And then like, you can put your resume there, et cetera. That looks very nice. Yeah, if you are interested in like some of the more advanced topics or anything, you can like stay around and like interact with us. We are more than happy to share with you some of the more advanced stuff. Otherwise, hopefully we see you over for the next two workshops. Yep. Just subscribe to our Telegram channel for the event updates at NUS Hackers. So.